Praise God. Come on, let's just entertain him a little bit longer. Amen. I expect to see a victory here today. Be absolutely pointless to be in a church service like what we feel right, right now Hallelujah. and leave here without the victory. Amen. Hallelujah. He's standing here with arms outstretched right now. Ready to give a victory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Thank you to everyone that, are, that is here today. To all of our guests, thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Amen. Thank you for being in New Life Church. To you adults, <clears throat> thank you for being here to support the young people. Amen. I remember as a young person, there was a lot of older people prayed for me, invested in me, helped me. And not that I'm anything, but I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for some older, elder people with wisdom that didn't mind putting their arms around me and saying, we love you, we believe in you. And you can do this. Amen. With that being said, that this is a youth service, you're probably wondering why I'm up here. Because I'm knocking 50 on the door. I'm a long ways from the youth group. Sometimes I wonder myself what I'm doing up here. Amen. But a couple of weeks ago while driving home from work, the Holy Ghost began to deal with me. Yeah. Come on. About something and it was directed in a youth-oriented service, I could tell. And a few days later, Pastor made mention that we were having a youth service and it was on the schedule and I volunteered. I said, sign me up. I feel like God has talked to me about something. And I want to share it with the young people. So I, with that, I give honor to my pastor. And I appreciate Brother Birch and his confidence that he has in me. And I thank you for this church and your confidence that you have in me. And I appreciate you so much. And I, I'm grateful for... My family uh, was standing right here a few minutes ago and I looked and every member of my immediate family was up here on the platform worshiping God at one time. It may not do nothing for you, but it made my heart just turn cartwheels. Yeah. Amen. And I'm grateful for that. If you have your Bibles today, you want to turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. I won't preach long. Amen. Uh, pastor always has a lot more to say than I do. <clears throat> but I don't feel like I'll preach long at all. Matter of fact, my introduction will probably be longer than the whole message. Amen. I know that I'm standing between you and, and some barbecue back there. So... Uh, I'll be brief. But I do feel like I've heard from God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24. Very familiar text. It says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Say refused. Amen. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I want to attempt, with the help of the Lord tonight, today, to preach, that's not who I am. That's not who I am. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for His anointing. God, we love You, Jesus, and we thank You for this day. 
this opportunity that you have given us to be in your house. And God, we need you this morning. We are nothing without you. We are nothing without your anointing. God, I am nothing without your anointing. I need your power, God, your presence and your anointing to rest upon me today. God, anoint, Lord, the ears and the, as they hear the word of the Lord. And help us to be doers of your word, not just hearers only. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I told someone the other day that the length of time that it takes to drink water seems like 30 minutes. In the pulpit, anyway. And these young people have done listen to me up there in the upper room earlier, so they're probably tired of hearing me, but bear with me. Amen. <clears throat> That's not who I am. It was another bitter, cold morning in Everett's, Kansas, a rural farming town like so many hundreds of communities throughout the American Midwest as the world was waging the Great War World War One. <clears throat> the residents in the, those small towns were not strangers to hard, often back-breaking work. And for early, from an early childhood, they learned to value and even to love hard work. Chores were doled out nearly as soon as a child could walk. Such was the life of the Cunninghams. Father Clint was a water well driller who moved his family around a lot in a struggle to keep them fed. On August the 4th, 1909, while living in Atlanta, Kansas, Clint's wife bore him a son whom they named Glenn. And by the time he was six, Glenn was already working. Can I get a witness, Brother Glenn? <laughs> six years old, already working. He and his nine-year-old brother, Floyd, were assigned the duty of walking almost two miles to the schoolhouse to start the fire in the stove. That way, the room would be warm by the time the teacher and the other students arrived. One cold morning in February of 1916, Floyd and Glenn arrived at the schoolhouse and unlocked the door and were slapped in the face by the bitter cold drifting from that silent steel structure. The two boys loaded the large pot belly stove full of firewood and took the kerosene can and soaked the logs thoroughly, as they always did. The kerosene accelerated the process of ignition while also soaking into the logs and, and enough to allow the flames to begin consuming the wood. This particular morning, though, something went terribly wrong. After letting the log soak in the fluid for a bit, Floyd struck a match and dropped into the pot belly stove, and almost instantaneously, the fire took on life of its own. With a loud woof, fire exploded everywhere, engulfing Floyd and Glenn in a horrific sheet of flames. Someone had mistakenly filled the kerosene container with gasoline. Both of the boys were knocked to the ground by the explosion, writhing in an unspeakable pain. The flames quickly escaped the confines of the stove and violently swarmed throughout the entire schoolhouse. On this day, their older sister, Letha, had accompanied them to the school. She had been tending to other duties nearby and heard the commotion coming from the schoolhouse and she saw the menacing flames and rushed to the front door and in her horror was growing by the moment. She managed to open the door and coax her two siblings out of the inferno. She ran for help, but by the time she got back, Floyd was barely alive and he died shortly thereafter. Little Glenn was mercifully unconscious for hours as local doctors proclaimed him more dead than alive. His lower body had been ravaged by the flames. He awoke in the local hospital, his legs wrapped in bandages. The pain was unspeakable. 
He thought suddenly of his older brother and tried to spring out of the bed to find him, but he was not able to move his legs. He was crushed to learn that his older brother had passed away. He was forced to stay in the hospital for weeks. His legs remained bandaged and lifeless as he drifted in and out of consciousness. Hear me. He overheard the whispers and conversations from his mother and his doctor. First, they would, he said he would not survive at all. And then later they said that he would never walk again and urged his mother to allow him to amputate both of his legs. His mother, mindful of her son and already lost a brother, refused to let him lose his legs too. When the bandages were finally removed and Glenn was sent home, it was easy to see why the doctors were so pessimistic. Glenn had lost all of the toes on his left foot. And the transverse arch of the foot was ravaged. The flesh on his knees and shins had been eaten completely away by the flames. The right leg was grossly misshapen and was now full two inches shorter than his left leg. Although Glenn was unable to walk, it did not stop the burning determination within him to beat the odds that were stacked against him. One summer, sunny day uh, during 1919, the mother wheeled him out into the yard for some fresh air in his wheelchair, and as, as was her custom daily. She went back inside, and a few minutes later, to her astonishment, she looked outside and saw Glenn crawling across the ground. She rushed outside thinking something was wrong, but by the time she reached her son, Glenn had pulled himself across the grass and raised himself up on the picket fence. And he then proceeded to drag himself along the fence, stumbling as he tried to wheel his legs into function, determined that he would walk again, and that while resisting his mother's attempts, he was determined. He did this every day for weeks, until he wore a path all the way around the, the yard and by the fence. And slowly over a period of months, Glenn's legs began to function. And to the astonishment of the doctors, after he began walking, he also made another discovery. And that discovery was that it hurt too much to walk. So he would spend all of his time running everywhere that he went. So for the next five or six years, all he did was run. By the time he was 12, Glenn, running despite having legs that were still riddled with scars, was outrunning everyone in his age group in Elkhart, Kansas, where his family had finally set down roots. He went on to run track for Elkhart High School, becoming a miler. And in his last schoolboy race, he set a national record running the mile with a time of 4 minutes and 24.7 seconds. His freshman year in college, he set a record, a conference record at Lincoln, Nebraska with a 1.53.3 half mile and a 4 minute 14.3 second mile. He was getting faster. One week later in Chicago, he smashed an NCAA record in the mile with a 4.11.1 mile. At that time, no man had ever ran a mile at an outdoor meet faster than Glenn Cunningham. In 1932, Saul Cunningham won the NCAA 1500 meter championship and he earned a spot in the U.S. Olympic team. He placed fourth in the 1500 meter race at Los Angeles, missing the medals by only a few meters. In 1933, Cunningham graduated from Kansas with the highest academic marks in his class. That year, he won the AAU 800 meters, the AAU 1500 meters, and won the NCAA mile once again with a better time of four minutes, nine seconds flat. He was awarded, rewarded with the 1933 Sullivan Memorial Award as an outstanding amateur athlete of America. 
On June 16, 1934, the first Princeton Invitational Games with 25,000 people watching, he shattered the one-mile record with four minutes, 6.7 seconds. Cunningham finished his career with two NCAA titles, eight AAU championships, a satchel of world records, one of which stood for three years. Uh, he also won 21 of 31 indoor races at Madison Square Garden. My, what a feat for someone who had been severely handicapped. You may ask today, what does this story have to do with your title, Brother Stanley? Well, I'm glad you asked. I submit to you that that bright summer day in 1919 at the age of 10 years old when Glenn's mother rolled him out in the yard in his wheelchair, the past three years began to flood his mind. He could hear the voice of that doctor echoing through his mind as he looked at his mother that day and said, Glenn will never walk again. Glenn will never be able to run and play. Glenn will forever be confined to a wheelchair. Glenn will always remain a cripple for the rest of his life. And as he threw himself from that wheelchair that day, I have to believe that everything inside this young man was screaming, that's not who I am. That is not who I am. I will not go down in defeat. I will not be a cripple the rest of my life. I will overcome. I will be victorious because that's not who I am. And I believe today, sitting here under the sound of my voice, uh, amen, there's young people that the devil is whispering in your ears right now that you're a failure, that you're a mistake, uh, that you're a liar, that you're a fake, uh, that you're a loser. Amen. You, today, you need to square your shoulders up today and look uh, the enemy right in the face uh, and say, that's not who I am. I am a child of God. I am a blood paul child, uh, son or daughter of the king amen i will live victorious in this day and hour hallelujah that's not who i am amen 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 let's look back at our text we see a brief whenever we read uh, that moses refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter we, what we see here is a brief snippet of the life of Moses here in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. But if you go back to the beginning, you'll see parts of why his name is written there. Amen. It all started, and I'm not going to go into every detail, but we were there. Y'all were here, most of you were, when I taught on, on Moses. How that he lived under, under an era of time uh, whenever the Pharaoh had decided that every male child two years old and under was going to die because he was tired of seeing the children of Israel prosper. Right. Amen. And how that God led uh, Jochebed to... Uh, uh, she could only hide Moses for so long and then finally she had to do something about it and she built a little ark and they strategically placed the ark where Pharaoh's daughter would find it and how the, the daughter was uh, his sister was off to the side and made sure that as soon as she did find it that, that, that she walked up there and said I, I know where there's a nurse for this child and so Moses was able to be reunited with his mother Amen. But the reason why Moses' name is written in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11 is because of those five, four to five years theologians say that he spent with his mother. Amen. Because during those four to five years, she realized she didn't have much time. Because as soon as he was weaned, he was going to have to go into the hands of the Egyptians. Amen. And she put that in her, in, in this child. She drilled it in his mind that, let me tell you something, little boy. Listen to me, Moses. You are an Israelite. You will always be an Israelite. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Amen. There's not a multiplicity of gods. You are a child of God. You are a chosen one. You are an Israelite. And she drilled that and drilled that and drilled that for four to five years into this young man. Man's mind. 
And this ain't part of my notes, but we've got to do that. Folks, there's going to come a time whenever you're going to relieve, you're going to lose the clutches that you have on your children and what you've put in them while they were young. Amen. Is what's going to stand. But after that four to five year mark, the Bible said that 35 years he was influenced by Egypt. 35. Because it was somewhere around the 40 year mark and whenever he walked away. But 35 years, everything under the sun was offered to him. Amen. Everything was at his disposal. And some say that he was even set up to where he might have possibly been the next Pharaoh. Because uh, Pharaoh's daughter didn't have any more children. He was the only one. Everything was at his disposal. Amen. He was able to be handed everything. Uh, it was such a rich land that it was almost like a blank check he had laid out before him because he was so powerful. And he lived in that. And he had the influence of everything inside of him that, 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 that the Egyptians could give. You know the idolatry and the worship and all the things that the Egyptians do. He was involved in all of that. He was around it for 35 years. But what his mother put in him for five. When he turned 40. That's why they wrote in Hebrews chapter 11. That Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Amen. I have to believe that when he turned 40. And he saw that Egyptian smiting that Israelite that day. Amen. That was the day of the deciding factor. Something welled up on the inside of him. And said this is not who I am. I am not an Egyptian. I was not born like this. I was not raised like this. My mother instilled the goods into me. Amen. I know better than this. I know how to live better than this. Amen. This is not who I am. Hey man and young people, can I tell you today that you've sat on these pews. Your, your mother and your daddy have prayed for you. They've fasted for you. They've been on their face before God for you. they brought you to church. They give money after money after money to send you to youth camp. To send you to holiday youth convention. To, to NAYC. They're putting everything they can in you. So that one day, whenever you're faced with the decision of whether you're going to be an Egyptian or whether you're going to be a child of God, you'll rise up and say this is not who I am. I am a child of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. I am a child of God. Yeah. Moses refused. He couldn't live that lie any longer. For 35 years he walked around acting like an Egyptian. Matter of fact, whenever he went into the wilderness and he met his father-in-law, he met those daughters, the first thing they did, they went home and they told their daddy, an Egyptian was the one who bailed us out today. Because he still looked apart. But deep down in his side, inside of his heart, he was screaming, this is not who I am. This is not who I am. I'm not an Egyptian. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. And young people, as you grow older and as you get out on your own, there's going to have to come a time in your life when you stare yourself in a mirror and you say, that's not who I am. That's not who I am. I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. Mark chapter 10 you have that very familiar very familiar text put this on me brother just drape it over my shoulder Mark chapter 10 verse 46 the Bible says and they came to Jericho and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, with a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side, begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. 
But he cried, the more great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, be of good cheer, rise, he calleth for thee. I want you to notice verse 50. Amen. The Bible says in verse 50, He, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Hallelujah. Why did he cast away that that garment? Because that was his identification. No matter day or night, When somebody came walking down that Jericho road and they saw him begging with that cloak on, they automatically knew who he was because he was identified by that cloak that was put upon him. They knew he was a beggar. He had always been a beggar. Every time they walked by there, they saw that cloak. He was a beggar. And they began to identify him with his garment. But the Bible said that whenever he heard Jesus was coming, amen, he began to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard it, he stopped and he called for him. And the Bible said that when he stood up, He cast that garment off of him. Because something on the inside of him was saying, I'm going to come in contact with the master and that's not who I am anymore. I am not a beggar anymore. Amen. I'm not a loser anymore. That's not who I am. I will never go back to that. Amen. So there's no need in me having it. And I submit to you today, That there's young people sitting on the sound of my voice. uh, That the enemy, the enemy is walking around daily. And he's putting things on you. He's taking these garments uh, and he's placing them on you. uh, And he's saying, here, here, put this on you. Put this on you. I'm going to give you a garment uh, of depression. Come on. I'm going to give you a garment. uh, I'm going to give you a garment of pornography. Come on, I want everybody to know who you are. Amen. And he's trying to give you some type of identity that you're not supposed to have. Amen. But there's something on the inside of us, young people. We've got to stand up and cast that stuff aside and say, that's not who I am. I am not into that. I am above that because Jesus has set me free. Hallelujah. That's not who I am. That's not who I am. Hallelujah. Take those garments off. Take those things off that the enemy's putting on your back. That's not who you are, young people. Amen. Hebrews 12 and 1 says, Let let us lay aside, lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Those things that he's putting on our backs, we got to cast that stuff off because that's not who you are. That's not who you are. Amen, amen. You musicians could come. I told you I wasn't going to preach long. I'm going to preach a little bit longer, but I'm just giving y'all some hope. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Amen. That's what we need to do. When the enemy lays something on us, when he puts his garment, his identity, who he thinks we ought to be, when he puts that on you, young people, you've got to cast that off because that's not who you are. That's not how you were raised. That's not what's in your DNA. Amen. You're apostolic, one God, apostolic, tongue-talking, Holy Ghost-filled young people. Amen. You're not who the enemy says you are. Hallelujah. You can rise above those things and cast them to the side. Amen. Luke chapter 15, very familiar text. I've preached this, I don't know how many times, but I really feel like God showed me a new revelation of this scripture, of these scriptures uh, yesterday, matter of fact. It says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. 
And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the young son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And, and there he wasted. When you walk away from God, you're wasting your time. He wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. And he began to be in want. Here we have a young person, young man, walked away from daddy. You know, I, it's hard to believe that I was a young person one time. And yeah, it's been a long time ago. But I know what it's like when you start experiencing a little bit of freedom. And then all of a sudden, you don't want nobody telling you what to do. Don't act like I don't know what I'm talking about. I've been there. You don't want nobody telling you what to do. And that's what this young man was faced with. I don't want nobody telling me what to do. Just give me what's coming to me. I'm going on. I'm going to do my own thing because I know what I'm doing. So he did. And boy, he lived large and in charge for a little while until the Benjamins run out. And then all them friends that he thought he had, they were only fair weather friends. They were only there for the loaves and the fishes and the party. Because when time got tough, they were nowhere to be found. And he was destitute, broke. Everything was falling down around him. But I want you to notice verse 15. It says, And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. Remember now, wasn't nobody going to tell him what to do. And he, that's not the prodigal son, that's the citizen, sent him into his fields, his fields, to feed swine. When I read that yesterday, sitting right up here in this upper room up here, the Lord spoke this into my spirit. I'm not trying to be super spiritual. I just know what I felt and what, what God showed me. He said, when you walk away from God and become unequally yoked with the world, at that point, it decides for you. Notice the prodigal son didn't decide to end up in the pig pen. The Bible says the one he was yoked to decided that for him. When you walk away from God, you lose all control. Because at that point, the enemy starts dictating for you. Oh, I don't want nobody to tell me what to do. But yet, he's telling you every step. He's leading you in every direction. And he's heading you down a road where you'll end up just like this young man in a hog pen somewhere with no friends, no family, nobody to turn to. And everything fell down around you. That sounds terrible, Brother Stanley. It is. I've been there. I've been in that hog pen before. I know what I'm talking about. But that's not the end of the story. There is a verse 17. And let me read it to you. Verse 17 says, And when he came to himself. <laughs> Thank God. When everything comes back to reality 
and you come to yourself. And when you do, everything inside of you, all the years that your parents, your family, your pastor, your youth pastor, whoever put in you, start screaming, this ain't who I am. This, this ain't who I am. This ain't what my mom and daddy taught me. I know better than this. I'm not supposed to be living like this. This ain't where I'm supposed to be. And he got up because he realized that's not who he was. And he went back home to a daddy that was standing there just like this. That same daddy that had put everything he knew into him at a young man was standing there wanting him to come back, waiting for him to come back. And in the back of his mind, he was saying, I knew that wasn't who my boy was. I knew that's who, that, that wasn't my daughter. Come on back, baby. And he made it home. But it was not until he realized this is not who I am. Hey, somebody here today, there's a bunch of decisions floating around in your mind right now. Why don't you listen to that inner side of what's been instilled into you that's screaming to the top of its lung, this is not who you are. Don't do this. Don't go there. Don't be a part of this because this is not who you are. Can we stand? In this crazy world of technology we live in today, media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, they all have one agenda. Every one of them. They want to decide who you are. You know why? Because they're pushing you for it every, t every day. <clears throat> Those friends that you see on social media sites, and trust me, I know what I'm talking about. You, you see the limelight. You see the highlight reel of their life. Oh yeah, they're holding the keys to a brand new sports car. But what they don't tell you is they can't afford it. But oh, if I could just be like them. You see them hugged up to some cool dude. Oh, I wish I had a boyfriend like him. He's so dreamy. But what you don't know is on the back burner somewhere, he's beating the daylights out of her sometimes. But all you see is the... And I, oh, I wish I could be like that. That's, they're, they're pushing you and they're trying to decide who you are. But the enemy is, is trying his best to decide. But there's something on the inside of you that ought to be screaming, that's not who I am. I know how it is. I, I, I've caught myself getting caught up in that stuff. Man, these people must be, well, look at that. they got that fine boat and that fine car and that fine truck. And, and uh, I work for TextDot. Oh, Cecil, where do you go? I don't work in the oil field no more. I'm just saying that these things, the world, the enemy, He's trying his best to decide for you who you are. And today is the day you need to stand up and say, that's not who I am. You're not labeling me. You must have the spirit of Moses. Bartimaeus. And the prodigal son, 
I'm not going to let the world give me my identity. So today you need to look at the world and say that's not who I am. I'm a child of God. And today I'm drawing the line in the sand. Because over there is not who I am. I am who God's called me to be. Amen. As they begin to play, I'm opening up these altars today. And I beg you to stand up for yourself. Have some dignity. Have some self-worth. Don't let nobody tell you who you are except for God. Because they will choose the wrong direction. And they will convince you that you're someone that you're not. Amen. Would you come today? Let's talk to the Lord this morning. Let's let Him give us that spirit of determination that we need to, to rise up in this day and hour. And not let them decide who I am. Lord, here I am on my knees today. I want you to help me. To show me who I am. And let me see my self-worth in who you are in me. Hallelujah. Would you come?